Right. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming along this evening. Um, I've been working on this for around three years now, on and off, so it's consumed a considerable amount of my time. Um, and I'm actually very pleased to be in this position tonight. Um, John would say I've been relieved um, to be in this position tonight. So just to give you some background um, to the project, I mean, Kevin's touched on it. Um, Edwina Hart, several years ago, set up um, a task force uh, to look at the regeneration of Newport. Um, Simon Gibson chaired this task force, and one of the recommendations that they actually made was to set up what they called then was a software university. That's been on and off the card for the last decade or so. And out of this software university, out of this recommendation, then the Software Academy grew. So as Kevin's mentioned, it's a partnership between Cardiff University, the Welsh Government, and the Alacrity Foundation, of which Simon is a part and John represents today. Because it's the, obviously the regeneration of Newport is based at the, what we call the platform um, in Devon Place in Newport. And we wanted to try and establish the academy as soon as possible. And we've actually done it from uh, last month. So the first cohort started last month. We have a set of strategic aims. Um, the first one is to significantly increase the, the number of software engineering graduates we actually produce it from. At the moment in the School of Computer Science, we roughly produce around 120 graduates across all our programs. Most of them will be computer science, say roughly 100 say, um, and only say five to 10 will be software engineers. So it's a very small footprint. The second aim would be um, to, for the students to come out of that degree with what I would say would be a better or more appropriate set of skills for industry. So that they then become, at the moment, graduates would start at, the, at a company in this technology centre uh, uh, area and they may be trained for six months or a year. What we are trying to aim is that they actually start being productive from day one. Then the other aim would be obviously to contribute to the Welsh Government agenda for regenerating new I personally have a fourth strategic aim, which is to better engage with the, the valleys in Wales, to try and encourage the students there, or potential students, to actually apply for university. I don't think we engage that well at the moment, so we could use this, or I've been using this, as a way of engaging potential students. Um, at least to encourage them to go to university, Cardiff if possible, and to do software engineering if possible. We have a series of academic aims as well. Um, we've set up what we call the BSc in Applied Software Engineering with effect from last month. That's our first cohort. We have 25 students. We're aiming to produce th eventually 300 graduates in software engineering from Cardiff annually. So this is very ambitious. As I've said, this is um, currently we produce around 120 across our board of computer science, but only a handful would be software engineering. But we need to actually tackle this um, shortfall of 3,000 annually just in Wales. We can't do it on our own in Cardiff, but we would need to do it nationally and within the UK. There's an emphasis on small group project-based teaching using real commercial projects. And these will be used as the basis for the academic content within the degree. So it's within the context of a commercial project that is of value to the uh, to industry and obviously that um, goes on or the corollary of that is that we actually engage with industrial experts with those projects and the students would actually deal with them possibly on a day-to-day -day basis further academic aims is that the students will learn by practice currently what they do is they, they will just basically learn knowledge of theory so it could be typically in a lecture it could be a, a, a lecturer there talking to 100 students. They may deal with a topic that they may never deal with again, possibly in 10 weeks at an exam if it comes up. If they're lucky, it would be in three weeks or four weeks in a piece of coursework. But here, they're going to practice everything that they do. Because of that, there's a greater emphasis on coursework assessment. It's not only coursework assessment. We still need exams, and there will be exams there. We will try to mimic the workplace as far as possible. 
So the emphasis on teamwork. So it's very rare that individuals, when they're in the industry, actually work individually. Uh, so then they will be part of the team and that is integrated into the program. We will look at agile methodologies and current development tools, whatever they are. Yeah. So we will, remain, we will try to remain up to date with industry requirements. And we want to make students highly employable, as I said, from day one when they finish the degree. Yeah. So they could build up um, a portfolio of commercial projects with the industrial mentors that they can then use to sell themselves to industry. And then hopefully we could get to the stage where students are actually offered employment while they're still on the degree. Our teaching approach, I briefly touched on this, is <laughs> learn by doing, learning by practice. There are absolutely no lectures. So that's quite radical for the university. Um, there was a few problems we had to get through to get this approved that we won't go into. Um, but we needed to be radical. What the last thing I wanted to do was do the usual thing. Yeah? There's just no point. Yeah? So the first year they usually work in individually and or in pairs, and then the remainder they could be in small teams up to four set, as appropriate for the work that they, they're doing at that point. There's a mix of assessment methods, as I've mentioned, coursework and exams, but it's delivered as part of the content within the, the, the commercial project from industry. We currently have a tutor ratio of one to eight. We have 24 students, which was very good this year because we did it outside the UCAS cycle. Um, and some of the lectures are here tonight. We have a weekly structure of three days a week, 10 to 4 p.m. So on a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Typically, there's a project meeting starting at 10 o'clock for roughly 10 minutes to say what we're going to do during that day. So that's completely different to what they would normally do in a normal student environment, where they may have two or three lectures a week. So this is the environment that we currently have. There's a large room uh, where there's, there's tables of four students, so they could work individually in pairs or in groups of four quite easily. And then at the, you can't see it, but at the end of this room, then that's where the staff are. So the dynamics are completely different. The staff interact very closely with uh, the students on a, you know, on a minute by minute basis. So our teaching approach, as I said, we have a network of industrial mentors. We're always looking for more, but we have a, a sizable one now. These can be used to deliver part particular sessions, um, or particular topics, viewpoints on particular subjects. And these could offer advice face-to-face uh, -face at the building in, Card uh, at, in Newport, or remotely uh, through Skype or email. We usually have three-week cycles delivering to these customers, so these commercial projects. Typically a two-week development sprint where we discuss requirements, what the coding is needed, the techniques required, and so on. And then one week of reflection and learning um, from that project. Industrial engagement, so, uh, um, this is key to the success of the academy. Obviously, we need to involve both the public and the private sector. And we realize that we, this needs to be of mutual benefit. If it's not of mutual benefit, it just won't work. Yeah. Uh, so from our point of view and the student point of view, having industry involved, real people that are working on real projects that the students can develop, that's useful for us and the students. From the um, industri industrial organization's point of view, then they're actually getting, first of all, students to work on particular projects that are relevant to them but also then they can build up a relationship with the students throughout the three years. So they could offer them employment if they think, or they could guide their development through various projects um, throughout those three years. There is a model in, um, in Canada at Waterloo where the, the course is actually so successful, the students are offered jobs um, during year one, year two, and year three. It's that well respected. That would be our um, ultimate aim for this. And there's various ways that the um, industry members can get um, involved. We have, as I said, many organizations involved um, at the moment. This is just a snapshot. Some very large ones, Microsoft, Admiral, which we'll hear from later, Oracle, and also smaller ones with one or two people in there. Yeah. But that's good for us. We want the diversity there. Uh, because the other thing we're trying to get across to the students is that um, there's not just one right way of doing things, there's different opinions on things. Different companies, a 
and individuals in, in the companies have different viewpoints on various things. We want to get this across to the students that there is different, different opinions. It's not just in the usual lecture format, then the lecturer will say, this is how it is, this is the right answer. There's different viewpoints. We need to get that across. So diversity is good for us. Just finish off on the pilot year, which the students will talk on. Because this was such a radical change for us, we ran a pilot year last year where we used eight students um, and they will give their viewpoints um, and their experience uh, later on. Uh, John. Oh, go on. Thanks. Uh, just to touch on a couple of things Steve said. We've been working on this perhaps a little bit longer than three years because we started, we were actually going to try and do a, uh, make it a private university and a commercial operation. But clearly that was going to take too long, so we got engaged with um, Steve. It's been three years. I'd never worked with Welsh Government or a university before, so it actually feels like about 15 to 20 years. <laughs> okay. so it's, but despite all of that, you know, I've got to thank Steve and, and everybody in CompSide because they've been unbelievably supportive. You know, we've come in and said, we want to teach in a work-ready way, and we've taken a lot of what we've done, taken on graduates who weren't rec work ready and taught those, and we've adopted a lot of those principles. We've had lots of strong debate, I would say. Certainly myself and Wendy have had many a strong debate. And I think, you know, particularly where they've enforced some kind of ac academic rigor that perhaps I wasn't that bothered with, to be perfectly honest, okay? So I think we found some really good middle ground. The other thing I would say is that the software industry, you know, and I've been in it for a very long time, have been very poor at actually explaining to universities what they actually need out of their graduates, okay? So I think this has been an excellent opportunity to, to cover that one side. I think we've also been unbelievably poor at explaining to students in schools what kind of career they could have from software engineering, okay? And part of the problem we've got is not enough people actually apply in the first place. So, you know, Steve said, we've, we've got a big engagement process ongoing. We've got to reach out to lots more females. We've got to reach out to lots more of those BTEC students, and we've got some very capable and successful BTEC students on this particular course. You know, and we've got to reach out to those bright A-level STEM students who at the minute would prefer to do maths or physics and keep their options open rather than actually commit to something in comp sci. So I think we've made great progress on the industrial side. We've still got a long way in terms of actually selling the opportunities that software engineering has in terms of teamwork, teamwork flexibility, ability to learn, all of those things, I think, we are making a very poor, you know, and I would encourage anybody that's in the software industry to, to, to reach out to schools and actually help that process. In terms of the skills and the syllabus, we have changed some of the technology that the course is covering, but to be honest, it's more, it has been more about the ethos and how we teach the course than actually the technology itself. Okay. We certainly are emphasising that we want them to be very strong in one commercial language and have the ability to transfer those skills to multiple other languages rather than have a smattering of lots of languages but not really understand how they're applied into a commercial context. We absolutely want to build professional relationships with industry, both to keep the course fresh but also for them, to, for the students to actually get a different perspective. But I also think that, you know, software industry is all about a lifelong commitment to learning. If you're going to be in the software industry, you're going to have to be learning new skills and technologies year in, year out. And what better way to sort of reinforce that mentality into students than to meet senior engineers who've been doing that for 20 or 30 years. There are some aspects on current courses where they do some team project work, but it's pretty lightweight just because of the mechanics around the course. We very much focus on working in teams to begin with and working on each other's code. Nothing is more focused, focuses the mind more than working on someone else's code rather than on your own code, okay? And just general principles about how you actually deliver software, okay? One of the other things that current academics courses don't cover particularly well is actually working on large code bases, okay? Most projects are actually fairly well constrained because that's the easiest way to manage them. And what we're really trying to open it up, embrace open source, you know, a good engineer will write as little code as possible and reuse what's already out there in the market and focus his code on the USP for that product. 
we need to get that mentality into students to just leverage what's already there and actually ex exploit that and put your expertise into the area that um, you're, you're not doing to get today. I don't know how many people are technical, but certainly, you know, industry has moved on. When I started with some of the people in the audience with punch cards and paper tape readers and, and girls who keyed in your coding sheets for you, you know, you had a very, very small part of this overall picture. Now every engineer is expected to engage with customers, understand what they want, and follow it all the way through to testability and deploy, deployment into live cloud-based services. So we need to teach them that. We certainly need to teach them how to maintain and upgrade other people's code, because that is a core competence that really goes nowhere near um, schools today or colleges. And the other thing is interacting with customers. You know, I think th there is some element of team working in current courses, to me, this is more about negotiation, okay? It's more about understanding what you're capable of, estimating the work, being able to prioritize that work, and convincing the customer on the right order to do that work and negotiate with the customer. And there's a lot of focus in this course around those kind of elements. In terms of the course structure itself, we tried to structure the course so actually if you dropped out at the end of any of the years, you already have some core competencies, okay? So the first year is very much about becoming a competent mobile and web developer. Um, and I, like I said, I'm not sure how many people are technical, but the course started at the end of September. I went in on the second Monday and asked the students, two of the students, they were in early, which is a good sign, they were in at 9 o'clock and it's a 10 o'clock start, and they said, you know, they, they were in big debate, and I said, what are you arguing about? And they said, we're arguing about how to use Git and our source control system, okay? And it's like, my God, you know, most students would not go near a source control system probably until their third year. They were on week one, and they were already making those kind of, you know, arguments. They've been there four weeks now. They delivered, they're just about to deliver their second project. They're starting live projects um, with real live customers um, in a couple of weeks' time. And certainly one of them with the Football Association of Wales, there's an expectation they'll actually deploy that into a live service by the end of the year. So within the first semester, some students will actually be building live product. At the end of the second year, it, the way I think of this is we'll be teaching them all the enterprise abilities, okay? So they'll have coding ability from the first year. This is enterprise ability. It'll be testability. It'll be traceability. It'll be scalability. It'll be repeatability. It'll be all of those things that actually make you an experienced commercial enterprise developer. Things that, at the minute, can't get taught because there's just too much to teach. So we've had to, I mean, I'll be brutally honest, a lot of the questions we've had from both industry and academic is about the things we've left out of the course. Okay? So our focus is, yes, we know we're leaving things out, but at the minute we think these are important. Okay? So we've put these things back in. Okay, yeah, I'm getting the hurry up. The third year, I mean, I don't know if you see emerging technologies one and emerging technologies two. We do not know yet what we're going to teach because it's two and three years away, okay? If anybody's out there in the industry, get involved and help us work out what to teach and then help us actually teach it, okay? Thanks. That's where we are now, which is not a very attractive place at all, and that's hopefully where we're going to be, which is a purpose-built building on the back end of Newport. Muted. Yes, good. Okay, so um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about why Admiral are uh, interested in the Software Academy and what we think it'll it'll bring to us as a business. Uh, and I'm going to get straight into it, so I don't get these these really these hurry up signs that I've been threatened with down the front. So, um, so first of all, who am I? Um, so, as you see up there, I'm able to handle a couple of very energetic children, uh, which puts me in good stead for working at Admiral, which is a very energetic. Uh, and, and uh, fast paced place to work. Um, I've got a history in technology. I started off as a COBOL developer, which I thought would be great because you'd think, oh, that's a long time ago. And then John goes and mentions punch cards. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so if you know what COBOL is, then congratulations on your experience. If you don't, congratulations on your youth. Um, I've been working at Admiral for about 10 years. And I started there as a project manager. And I'm now a program director. Um, and I'm, I also look after IT delivery, so I kind of wear, wear two hats at Admiral. Um, 
And recently this year, I completed my MBA here in this fantastic uh, institution. Um, but that's probably, probably enough about me. Um, but I do have a technical background, so I know some of what I'm talking about. Um, in terms of... In terms of Admiral, well, Admiral's a financial institution, it's an insurance company. It's not that. Um, I know that's a bit cliched, uh, but it's there for a reason, because I want to take you on a little bit of a journey, because if you're local and you know about Admiral at all, you probably think of Admiral as a bit more like that. Um, it's got a bit of a unique culture. Uh, that's what people think of Admiral. It's, it's kind of very team-based uh, environment to work in. Um, it is a big insurance company, you know, we're one of the biggest motor insurance companies in the UK, we've got several brands, we also have an aggregator site that I'll come back to a little bit later, uh, which, which is confused. Um, and we do have this culture, a very team-based culture, kind of agile culture, which again I'll come back to later. But really, you know, you get these views, is it a big financial institution? I suppose it is. Um, is it this fantastic culture? I suppose it is. Uh, but underlying all of it, really, at the heart of Admiral, is that. Um, it's a technology company. Whichever way you look at it, it's a technology company. Um, and I'll be expecting some questions on this slide over tea and coffee later, so if you could pay attention, that would be great. Um, so this is kind of what powers the UK business. Um, and it's up there really just for effect, because pe people do think of, um, of, of businesses uh, for the main thing that they do. So when people think of Admiral, they don't think of this. Um, and that's part of the problem that we've got. <coughs> Um, and one of the reasons why um, I'm so keen to get engaged with these guys at the Software Academy is to, so that people do understand that. Um, that, you know, most big businesses are powered by technology um, and we're no different. And I could put up another three or four diagrams like that that would you know, span the rest of the world and the other, the other businesses we've got across Europe and in the US and Canada and India. And they're all powered um, by technology. Um, the other thing I suppose to mention, which is key to the business, as well as the, the complicated technology, you know, there are two things really that run Admiral, it's the technology and the people, and really that's what we're trying to bring together here today. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about the people later and some of the challenges that we have. Um, I wasn't sure how technical the, uh, the, the, the crowd would be today, so it's just a little bit on actually what is, you know, obviously I'm not expecting you to look at that really, but... What is the technology really? So, you know, underpinning the work that I do day to day um, at all these types of technology. And, and if you look at the top of that list and a bit further down as well, a lot of it is development and, it, and it's software development skills that we need um, to, to, help us, to help us run the business. Um, and we could need good technical people who are able to deliver this stuff for us here in Cardiff uh, because that's where everybody is. That's powering all this stuff that's happening across the world. Uh, for, for Admiral. So what's the, what, what's, the, what's the challenge for us really? So there's a little bit of background for you, but the real challenge for us is the demand for people and the change that we need to implement at Admiral. Um, so we've just got a lot of technology change, like any business I suppose, you know, you're just trying to keep up uh, with what's going on in the industry, um, both from a technology perspective and an insurance perspective. So over the past 18 months or so, uh, at Admiral, we've been undertaking a fairly major transformation program for our technology, which is essentially swapping out almost all of our legacy stuff and replacing it with new stuff. And that's the scientific explanation. Um, and the name for that program is, we call it Program Bolt, because we're trying to do it as fast as possible. Um, and our COO, a guy called David Stevens, who's um, a slightly older uh, version of, uh, of me, a white guy in his 50s, actually stood up dressed as Usain Bolt and announced the, the programme to all of the, uh, all of the senior managers at Admiral. I don't mean the technical guys, I mean all of them, uh, which, was, which was quite amusing. When I say dressed as Usain Bolt, he put a, bit of a pair of shorts on and a running vest, but um, you, you, get the, you get the message. Um, so yeah, we've, we've had a bit of a challenge in, in how do you get the people to deliver um, change on that scale. You know, it's, it's hard, especially here in South Wales. So we've had around 300 people here in Cardiff working on this, this programme of change. Um, and through that, we've had a run rate of approximately 50% of those people. Actually, right now, it's just over. It's 52, I checked today. 52% of those people, as we, as we speak today, are either contractors or consultants. And that's a problem. Um, now, some of them we'd need to do anyway, because some of them are specialist skills. 
um, that wherever you were, you know, unless you were in London, probably you're not gonna you're not gonna get them. And that's fine, and we don't mind that. But some of them aren't. You know, so, some of them are, um, you know, pretty standard stuff, really. You know, some of the technologies that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so the Java stuff, which is which is you know should be easy to do. Angular, which is the you know all the rage on web development now. You know, we should be able to get these people. Um, and I don't really want to give the impression that we can't get any of them. We can, but it is harder than it needs to be, and it takes time. Um, it takes time from two perspectives. One, to actually find them in amongst everybody, and two, to get them up to speed, uh, which is another reason why I like uh, some of the things that the guys are talking about in terms of what the curriculum looks like. So we're a little bit unique at Admiral, so we bring permanent people into IT, and we accept that actually there's a, there's a kind of six to nine month delay, but that's because we want to put them out in the business. Um, so that's probably the first thing we do is we move them around all the different operational areas of the business, not IT at all. And then what would be great is if we could bring them into IT, they already have the skills, the, the, the development skills, and they can just get on with it. But actually what happens is we put them around the business, we bring them in, and then we teach them the stuff about IT, um, which is then you're looking at 12 to 18 months to get somebody productive. It's too long. Um, and then you react and you end up going to the contract market where you could be spending 500 to 1,000 pounds a day um, on people to do the job. So yeah, it's expensive. It's an expensive way of doing it. And I think the only way to break the back of that is to get ahead of the game um, and to stop reacting and to think about the future a bit more, which is really why I'm, I'm, I'm keen to keep the relationship with these guys open because, you know, yes, it might be three years down the line, um, but you can see the benefit of it. And I think if we can, can all have that slightly longer term view, uh, then we can solve some of these problems. The other issue that we've got, um, if you use our temporary staff and consultants, is, is knowledge transfer. And that you know, it might sound like a bit of a throwaway, but it's an absolute killer for us right now. You know, we're due to go live with this big program of work in the next month or so, which we've been working on for two years. And one of the challenges we've got is getting the final bits done, but also we're going to have to let all these contractors and consultants go at some point in the next three or four months. So we need their knowledge in these people who are actually just still delivering their work. So it might not sound like much of a challenge, but it's a massive challenge. Um, and, and if we could get uh, more permanent people in who could do the job, yeah, that would all become a bit easier, I think. Um, I'm going to go back and talk a little bit more about Admiral. So, you know, I, just, I said earlier that success is about people and technology. So let's talk about the people a little bit. What has, what has put Admiral aside from some of its competitors over the last 20 years is innovation. Um, so if you look at elephant.co.uk, it, 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 it was the first big um, internet-only direct motor insurer. Confused, you know, the first motor aggregator, we did that too. Um, and Multicar, which you'll now see the adverts for, Direct Line doing it, everybody else is doing it. We do it probably cleverer than anybody else. And that was a bit easier back in the day because they were the only things that we were doing. Um, and we had a small team of people who were clever and could focus on it. Um, it's getting harder because there's much more we need to do um, and it's absolutely critical for Admiral that we keep that edge, that innovative edge that we've always had um, and in order to do that again we need the people to do it um, and like I said earlier you know we have a good team I don't want to say that my current delivery team are no good they are they, they really are good but you need that fresh blood and you need the people with the thinking and, and you need to keep re-energizing that team um, if you're going to be successful so, you know, coming around the corner for us um, is a load of other R&D work that we need to do. You know, data, you know, data, 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 data. Everybody talks about data. I'm going to try not to use the phrase big data because that's the, that's the thing everybody talks about. But, you know, especially in the motor industry, telematics. I don't know if anybody's got a box in their car yet. You will have in the next 10 or 15 years. You absolutely will. They'll be in cars when you buy them. And the data that you get from that is massive. And the opportunity to analyse that data and do things with your customers you never know to do is huge. Um, so th those things are around the corner for us, more product innovation, you know, international growth. We're looking at some of the big markets in the world like Brazil and China. Um, mobile, which you mentioned earlier, is something you've got, your guys are doing in, in year one. We have that at the moment in terms of responsive websites. But you know, one of the good things about apps is how much data you can get um, almost sneakily. The T's and C's are right. Uh, but, you know, you stick an app on someone's phone, you're laughing, you've got all the data. So all this stuff's coming around the corner and, you know, we've not really scratched the surface of it yet. And again, I keep coming back to the fact that we need people to do it. So, so why, the, why the National Software Academy to do it then? So 
I'm just going to kind of reiterate some of the things that the guys have talked about really. So real life projects, we'll be able to work together. Um, mutual benefit was mentioned earlier and if you look at the bottom two points I'm making here, we're going to be mentoring some of the guys. That's good for my guys as well, it's good personal development for them and hopefully it's good for their guys. Um, then in the process, you mentioned DevOps, John, I think earlier, you know, DevOps, Agile, these are the sort of things we expect people to know when they come in through the door and they don't, um, so we need to teach them. Um, I've been in the software industry for 20 years. I pretty much know, apart from the odd, the odd occasional person, almost 100% of the time, people learn best by doing at this thing. It's almost an art. You know, you can't just sit there and listen to somebody tell you how to do it. You have to do it. And I love that about the course. I think that's great. Um, and obviously, we'll have regular interaction with the guys. And, and at the end of it all, you know, we're looking for some really good technicians to come out of, out of uh, the academy that uh, hopefully will come and work for us which is another reason why we want to stay involved. So in a nutshell, you know, that's what it's all about for us. Uh, that, that's uh, why we're keen to stay involved and, uh, and do everything we can to help it, it be a success. Um, I know we're going to do questions later. Um, so that's my standard question mark I put at, the, at every PowerPoint that I do, but we're not going to do it right now. Uh, so, so yeah, that's me. Thank you. Can we invite our students now? Vanessa, Luke, and Chris to come and join us and uh, offer you the real truth. Okay, so uh, as I said before, we took part in the uh, pilot year. Um, I'm Chris. I, um, I'm currently in my third year at uh, Cardiff University of Computer Science. Uh, I'm Vanessa. I'm a joint student doing maths and computing. And, uh, yeah, um, I'm Luke. Um, I'm a student at Cardiff as well. I'm in my third year and I was part of the pilot year last year as well. So yeah, we can talk about our experiences. So uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is code ownership. So in university now, we kind of, we give them our coursework and then we kind of, uh, we have a set of things we have to achieve. So like, you know, get this output and then we kind of do that. And then once we've done it, we kind of throw it away, work on the next thing. Whereas uh, with uh, Software Academy, since we spent more time on projects, and they span a long time. So some of the projects we worked on lasted between two and four, five months. Yeah. So uh, there's quite a lot of uh, emphasis on having good code base, and feel more like connected to it, and motivated to make it work, uh, and, and to like you know be designed well. So um, uh, adding to that is uh, I probably spent more time independently learning during my time at Software Academy than I did uh, probably the last two years combined of my first years of university. So um, I had like 40 minutes or so bus ride to and from. So I spent that time with the podcasts. And then, so one of the good ones I found was an uh, Android development one. And from that, I learned a bunch of useful things I could use and apply to projects I'd been using. So it's really nice to have that kind of effect on the code base that you can add libraries and whatnot that just add uh, to the code and make it just easier for developers to develop on. Um, um, the project, um, so there's a lot of work with industry. Um, so the project that I probably learned the most from was Samsung Media. That was basically an Android application um, to grab coupons from TV. So um, we had one of their guys come over to teach us about Agile and Scrum, which is a development methodology. And before university, we kind of heard of it. We knew generally the good and bad points, but we hadn't like learned, like used it properly. So um, uh, for, for the team projects we did in university, it was mostly waterfall because it was just the easiest thing to do. So um, having the experience of being able to do it um, and apply it to what you're doing, so doing the daily stand-ups, having retrospects at the end of each sprint to like, kind of reflect and feed that back into the next sprint, uh, is really, really useful. And um, the best part I found of the year is probably working on new problems. So uh, when you're giving coursework, you kind of you know what to expect, where it's going to end, and kind of uh, the points to get towards it. But with these projects you're working on, you could kind of... Um, they didn't really have a defined end. There's all stuff you could be adding. So um, that was really interesting for me, just being able to just kind of, we could negotiate what we would put in the project. All right, um, so uh, just a little bit of an overview of what I did. I, I worked for um, uh, Langrog as well. Uh, I have helped build their um, Android application, which tracks the components, um, like the uh, the, the um, dispatch time from the warehousing and when it arrives on site and all of the extra details like who had um, propped the particular component or 
um, if there is a, an issue with it. And the other one was a project for um, the Office of National uh, Statistics. Um, I had to help build a, um, a simulation system for their census collection process. Um, and I built that using, I think, uh, mean stack, if anyone knows what that was. Um, so I want to kind of make a point on that. At university, um, during, uh, during my second year, I worked uh, on a web application. And we were kind of, not forced, but we were kind of directed to use a waterfall just to see the reason why it's bad. And that's, it's bad because they give you a set of requirements, and then you would go off and you do it, and then you deliver the results, and that's it. There's not, nothing changes, but that's not how it is in, uh, in, out there in the workplace. When you get your requirements from your clients, five months down the line, he's going to come in and, keep, and tells you to change something, and he will continue to do so, probably right up until you, you tell him to say no. Um, but obviously, if, there is, um, if you can negotiate and reason it behind that. Um, but yeah, th things change, and you have to be able to adapt to it. And the fact that they teach us th things like Agile, um, we were able to kind of like do some damage control if it's a, such a, like a drastic change and we'll be able to cope with it. Um, and um, yeah, they do encourage you to kind of do that. Um, the second thing is that I really liked being able to work with different frameworks and kind of develop the tools. I, I, I mean, for example, I, work, I used um, Laravel for one of our projects um, early on during the pla uh, placement. And um, the thing is, all of the skills that I had learned um, I was able to develop these really, really powerful uh, websites, which in the first year, I just didn't have enough time to kind of grasp the concept of being able to kind of apply that and have these uh, mentor, uh, mentors come in and tell me what are the best practices really did help me um, kind of master those skills. Um, things like source control, um, I use it now during my, um, so for my coursework now, because say that I've wanted to go and experiment on on a particular solution, and if I messed up, I don't have to rebuild the whole thing again. I can just do a command, and I'll get all of my working code back up again. Um, and um, and also because you're going to be working with a group of you know five to eight people in a team, when you have all these code bit like a massive code base, and you're trying to get things um, to kind of work together, you're going to have problems if you don't use source control. And that, that's that's what well I've managed to learn that now, and really. <coughs> Um, integrated that into the way I work. Um, and that um, what the experience I have gained, um, I've realized with the kind of the career choice or path that I want to go into. Um, the, especially with the Android, I really like Java and I really like how Android framework works. It's kind of the, the, the experience I had gained from that whole year made me realize what I wanted to do. Now that wouldn't have been possible at just my uh, computer science degree because um, I don't think Android frame um, development was part of the, any of the modules and if it was it would probably be as part of the extra curricular activities so yeah that's my part over to you so um, Chris and my talk about Chris and Mike ah, you're a pair um, <laughs> Mike's one of the other groups in our group from last year uh, Chris and Nick have talked a lot about sort of the technical stuff and the sort of skills, libraries, etc. And I really want to talk about sort of the software skills, the professional development that I've gained from it. So uh, one of the things that we really covered a lot is learning how to organize your time. And you think coming out of university the first few years, you would have done quite a lot of this. You, know, you would have talked about, uh, we should do this in order and this, and we'll cover all these skills, and it'll all be done in time, and nothing ever works out that way. Um, but particularly with the real life clients, the way it worked, particularly the Langer Rock project, um, where we'd have someone who's quite actively engaged in the project in terms of what they want and then taking on their sort of suggestions and things that they want changed um, sort of from the day before you have to deliver it or maybe the week before the next sprint um, is quite a challenge. And that's something that we've really gained from it in many ways because we know exactly, you know, how what we've done, how to move forward and how fast we work. You know, it's, it's the kind of things you wouldn't necessarily get in a coursework in a traditional environment because it's just not possible to build in that sort of time frame. Um, other things we kind of covered uh, include kind of being able to lead. So we've done a lot of, well, I've done a lot, especially on the Langrock project, but we've each taken turns to 
either lead a scrum or lead a meeting, write up the notes of the client meeting, communicate with them outside and inside of like the sort of supervised environment. And it's come on as part of this year that we've kind of learnt from going from full supervision to no, almost no supervision. So by the end of it, there was a point where me and Luke took over a handover meeting. It was a six-hour handover meeting straight with a bunch of dev guys who yeah. knew a lot more than we probably knew about it. Um, you had to kind of go through all of the code base. Like the majority of it wasn't really all all code, was it? It was it, because it was, it was either my co I was reading about talking about your code or you were talking about someone else's code, and it yeah. went on like that. So it's learning the skills to know how to, you know, approach something new. Like John was saying, you know, approaching a new code base that you haven't seen before and being able to explain it and taking the bouncing the feedback off your team to know, you know, how does it work, even if you don't know the details. It's, it's that kind of skill set that we we think we gain most out. Um, let's see. The other things we kind of covered, uh, sort of touched on, is we've learned about this ourselves. And in any way, it's not something that in a university environment that I've seen so far is covered very well. So like you, you tend to do things because you have to do them. You do them to get the exam, and you get the exam, you've got the grades, and that's it, you move on. Um, which unfortunately is quite true. Um, and in some ways, we all know what we like to specialise in now. We know this, the personal skills and professional skills, so whether it be leading, um, communicating with the clients, or you know, getting down to, you know, I just want to pair program this. Let me do this. You know, let me get on with this. And I, I want to test out all these different libraries. And once I've done it, I'll come back to you and give you your own feedback. And that's something that we've really felt is a useful. Um, so I've talked a bit about communication. Um, we've all had opportunities to talk um, at Digital 2015, when we were there, um, basically marketing the NSA, <laughs> that's your number, right? um, and it was quite good to see a sort of bouncing back our sort of teaching others what we taught ourselves, um, which is something that I think the new software program uh, is really looking at in detail. It's kind of giving yourself the skill set to, you know, build on your, your knowledge base without supervision and without pointers and tips that you don't necessarily receive in university. Um, and the other thing we had to cover was teamwork. So this is one of the things that we did. Uh, so we did an app, an Android app for the World Council of the Deaf. It's basically a dictionary app. They had a, they came with us, came to us with a book, which is literally pictures of signs and the translation of the book. And what they wanted to do was basically turn it into an Android app. And as a client, they're kind of all that you want and all that you don't want. So they know nothing about the software at all. Um, they just know they want this. And it's such a vague concept that we spent a lot of time sort of iteratively going through the requirements, establishing what we wanted, um, what we think they would like. And it's dealing with that kind of scenario which you, you won't get at university because everything is a simulated scenario. You know, everything is construed just to do a certain output, um, unfortunately. And that's one of the things we really gained on. I haven't really got much else to say. <laughs> that's <laughs> about kind of it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we'll be around. Something later. Yeah. We'd like all our speakers now to join us at the